Good evening, everybody. I have designated this guy my my uh, my board member. <laughs> so his responsibility would be to take care of the board. Remember, you're the board member. You're not boring. All right? All right? Not boring. Church board could be boring. All right? Okay. Good evening, everybody, again. Are you prepared to learn something? Yes. Yes. I always believe that there is much, much more in every text in the Bible. And I also believe that is the responsibility of the preacher and the pastor to study and then come and share with you, teach you what the Lord has taught us. So we believe that the Lord will continue to bless us. We have a good audience online. Okay, uh, last night we had uh, 200 something gadgets connected. And so we have a wonderful audience online. So those of you watching online tonight, thank you for joining us. I, we are grateful that even though you couldn't be here, you are connected to the program. And there are many of you who share the videos. So the messages are being spread. Amen. So thank you. Uh, we have two weeks only to win souls for the Lord. You must believe that. I say that again. You must believe. God will win people for his glory. And by faith, we do the work. Yes? Yes? By faith we do it. This is why God established this church. For this purpose. You must always have courage. Always have strength. I remember years ago I was doing a... I did a series of campaigns in Dominican Republic in a city called Santiago. And in one of these campaigns, we got there Sabbath morning, preached... Sabbath morning, Sabbath afternoon, almost the entire church came out in the afternoon to go out and give flyers, meet the people, invite them to the program. Sunday night, we had a social event for the community, and the people came, and the members were there. It was a wonderful program. And so Sunday night came to begin the campaign and it, when it was time for the campaign to begin, we had only six people in the church. Three of them visitors and three members. Those who were to conduct the singing were not there. Musicians were not there. Audiovisual technicians were not there. And I can see the pastor's face. I can see that he is discouraged. We were scheduled to begin at 7.30. It was now 8 o'clock and we still had six people. And I can see how discouraged the pastor was. I myself felt a little broken, as you might imagine, because you had such a good Sabbath, a good Saturday night, and you feel confident. And then Sunday night, to begin the campaign, six people, three members, three visitors. And the, I can see how deflated the pastor was. And I went to pray, because I myself needed strength that night and in prayer the Lord spoke to me in my heart the Lord said Christopher I don't always bless the way the program is run but I'll always bless the mission and that gave me strength because God is not always pleased with our attendance He's not always pleased with our singing because sometimes we mash up the hymn so much the person who wrote the hymn turned in his grave. 
He's not always pleased with the way we dress to come to programs. But he's always going to be with the mission. See, the program is yours. The mission is God's. It's not a program that saves the people. It's the gospel that does it. So I want you to have courage, brothers and sisters, that you are a part of the mission. I say it again. You are a part of the mission. Take courage. Come to the program. Call your friends. Don't stop telling them to come. And come. Don't tell them to come. And because they are not coming, you don't come. You come. You be here. Yes. Like I said to you last night, there was a teaching that I'm going to show you uh, this week or next week. How important it is to be in the house of God. Especially at this time, people prefer to just stay home because of, you know, Zoom and all these. They've become Zoomers or zombies. <laughs> prefer to stay at home. So you can't miss one night. And those of you watching online, maybe there are some of you who could come, but you feel that you're supporting by just being at home. We're glad that you're connected at home. But it will be a great blessing to see you here. We want to see you here. It will be a blessing. So if you can come, come. Bring your friends. Bring your enemies. If you have no enemies, make some and bring them. Bring them to the program. If you have no friends, you see somebody on the street walking and say, Hey, where are you going? I'll take you to a cruise. Hey, come. I said that as a joke in a church in Massachusetts some years ago. You listen to that. Some years ago. I said just as a joke, you know, just to relax the audience. The following night, a lady came with a woman and her three children. And her testimony was this. She remembered what I said. And she saw this lady and these three children, uh, two teenagers and a little girl, about seven or eight. And she stopped at the bus stop. They were waiting for the bus. She stopped there and she asked, where are you all heading to? And they said, where are we heading? And she said, well, I'm heading to a crusade. Come with me to the crusade and then I'll take you home. I went back the following year and that mother and the three children were still there baptized. So, go pick up some strangers and bring them tomorrow. <laughs> make, sure they, make sure they're not packing. All right? <laughs> make sure they're not packing. Well, God bless you. Thank you for coming tonight. I'm very eager to teach you what the Lord has taught me. So, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. We pray that your spirit will now take control. Help me to be careful. Because, Lord, as people compliment and say good things about the program, if I am not careful, it can go to my head, as we say here on earth, and I can become proud and self-sufficient and lose dependence on you and put the dependence on me, on my voice and my antics and what I know. So I ask for mercy. I ask that the audience will pray for me too so that you will keep me under the shadow of the cross, that I'll always be aware that while I'm preaching and at the end you alone get all the glory so tonight Lord prepare everybody's heart for your word and let Jesus be uplifted in his name we pray amen okay it's better there all right yeah because of the, the camera so I'll move my I'll move my um, your expensive oh you want me to stay this way <laughs> Okay, all right. This is the first time I've seen a flashy, modernized, technologically advanced uh, pulpit like this here. You know, look like a stool, <laughs> but it's okay. All right. Okay, now, you all can see the board. You can see it online well. Okay, good, nice. This here is the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? I'd like to share some with you very quickly. The gospel of Christ is this. The everlasting gospel is all of it. Yeah? In Revelation, the message for the last day is the everlasting gospel, which means you cannot just preach Jesus saves. You have to come here. 
and you have to go there. You'll hear more of that later on. Tonight's presentation is a transitional one. Transitional meaning, after tonight, we're no longer going to deal with how Christ is going to take you out of darkness. We have to come here. How is he going to put you in order? And how he's going to fill your life with his presence. All right? And the principle is taken from Genesis chapter 1. For example, how long did God take to take the earth out of order? I mean, take the earth out of darkness. How long did he take? Pardon? One day. So you got one right there. How long did it take to fill the earth with his presence? I have all night, so I could wait. <laughs> You're the ones who have to go to work tomorrow. I guess I relax and then I go to the gym. But you got to go to work, so you better answer the question quickly. How long did it take to fill the earth with his presence? Let me help you. Let me help you. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. That part, God made it holy, can be rephrased this way. God put his presence in it. Because only God's presence makes something holy. Not you, not the Jews, only God. For something to be holy, God has to give it his presence. His presence. So that's the Sabbath day. And that is, that was, that's just one day, okay? One day. How long did it take to solve the problem of this order? If you say six, then the earth was created in one day. So then God created the heaven and the earth in, in two days. Look at it. You got one day here, and you got one day here. You still have this problem to solve, the problem of this order. Five days. Thank you very much. Five days. What does that tell you? That tells you, and we repeat this next week, that tells you that God spent most of his time putting the earth in order. Yeah? He spent most of his time solving the problem of this order. How did he do that? With his word. How did he solve the problem of darkness? With his word. And here's where you have to listen before we get into tonight's message. Remember, it's a transitional presentation tonight. To take the earth out of darkness, God used his word and he said, let there be light. That was a powerful word, a necessary word. Did it work? It worked. Let there be light and there was light. It worked. Good. Let me ask you. If God returned the second day and said again, let there be light, a word that was so powerful the day before that there was light. It worked. It's powerful. And he decides, well, since it worked then, I'm, I will say it again today. And he said again on the second day, let there be light. Will it work? Exactly. It's not going to work. Even though it's a, it was a powerful word the day before. Since it had already accomplished its task, saying it again on the second day wouldn't work. Because there are other problems to be solved. You can't solve all these other problems with the same word. Amen? So on the second day, God said something else. For the third day, God said something else. It's the same thing in a campaign, in a crusade. You cannot have two weeks of crusade and every day preach that Jesus died for you. You understand that? The preacher cannot take this pulpit and every night, God loves you. Jesus died for you. The blood of Jesus washes away your sin. That's fine, but you have to move the people from one point to another because they have these other problems to solve. Which is why 
In the Adventist church, we can go five weeks in one campaign. Why? It's this principle. The principle of transitioning. Where the people come to the altar. Which is why in my campaigns, when I, do, when I make calls to the altar, the calls are different. After two or three nights, I no longer call people to the altar to accept Jesus. Because they did it already. I begin to ask you to come to the altar to, uh, to submit to obeying the law of God, for example. To change your health habits, for example. And these kind of Are you understanding? Okay? So now, in this campaign, we started Sunday night. We were here last night. Tonight we will begin here, but the sermon is to help us transition into what we're going to deal with for most of the campaign, which is how, to put, how God is going to put your life in order. And why are we spending most of the campaign here? Because in Genesis 1, God spent most of his time taking care of the problem of this order. You understand the, pro the, 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 uh, the direction that we're going? Yeah? Good. All right. Great. So, for tonight... The cross that leads to hell. The cross that leads to hell. Every denomination has a symbol that represents it or identifies it. You have the Star of David, and the Star of David identifies which religion? The Jews. You have the crescent moon and the little star next to it, that's uh, Islam. And you have the cross. The cross identifies Christianity, all right? If you see a cross on a building, that's not a Muslim mosque. <laughs> that's a Christian temple or worship place. So the cross is special to Christians. Even Paul said, I glory in the cross. The cross is special for us. We sing about the cross. We preach about the cross. We give poems about the cross. We even have the cross sometimes in some of our churches. Yeah? There are Christians around the world who cherish the cross so much they wear it around their necks. Mm -hmm. uh, they tattoo it on their bodies. I went uh, to I was in uh, New York once and I saw a man with so many crosses tattooed on his body. I said well, he's the best Christian in the whole world. I went to a village in a high mountain in Puerto Rico. I was up there doing a campaign. And that village is very, very special. Every home had multiple crosses around in their yard. And I asked, why are these people putting up so many crosses? And they said, because uh, they, the people in this village are very strange. They believe that the, cross, the crosses keep evil spirits away from their homes. So even, 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 even in the vampire movies, remember the vampire movies when we were younger? Uh, yeah, and uh, when the vampire is coming, you make the sign of the cross. Yeah, and the vampire goes, you don't want to see the cross at all. So <laughs> people believe that there is power in the cross. And yes, there is. There is power in the cross. Amen. So the cross is special to Christians. So special, we have it in our homes, we have it in our cars, we have it in our, our, on our Bibles. Some Christians make the sign of the cross, every little thing. If, for example, if there's a boxer who considers himself a Christian, before he goes to box, he kneels in his corner, he says a prayer, what does he do? Make the sign of the cross. A footballer, soccer player, when he gets tagged and he's going in, he's a substitute, he's going in now to play, he touches the ground and then he does what? He makes the sign of the cross and he goes out on the field. Once, once an individual believes that he or she is a Christian, that cross of Calvary becomes special to him or to her. For us Seventh-day Adventists, we don't wear it around our necks. We don't make the sign of the cross either. We don't tattoo it on our bodies. I hope not. We, we, we very rarely have it in the church unless we have a, an illustration for something. All right? So even for us, the cross is special. That cross of Calvary is special to all of us. And we can identify with Paul when he says, I glory in the cross. Amen? Amen. 
I have a question for you. I want you to convince me because sometimes we get accustomed to God that the things of God become uh, of very low value for us. I have a question for you. Is the cross of Calvary still special to you? And I want the people online to hear you respond. You can respond with amen. So uh, you don't have a yes here and an amen here. And I say, yeah, boy. And I don't. No, one word, just amen. Is the cross of Calvary special to you? Amen. I am not convinced. I'm asking you one more time. Is the cross of Calvary special to you? Amen. Great. I have one more question for you. Which one? Because on Calvary, there were three. Three crosses on Calvary. Two will lead you to hell. One will get you to heaven. Mm -hmm. Since we're sinful, and Christ said that man rather darkness than light, then we're prone to attach ourselves to the two other crosses that leads to hell. So it's quite possible that the cross you are holding on to all these years is the wrong one. If the location of the cross is what's important to you, all three crosses were on Calvary. If blood is what's important to you, blood flowed from every individual on all three crosses. So how sure are you that you have the correct one? You are not there when it happens, so you are, how sure are you that you're holding on to the one in the middle? You know the one in the middle is the correct one, but since you were not there to bow yourself before the cross in the middle, how sure are you that the one you're holding on to is the one in the middle? I am convinced that there are many Christians around the world who are holding on to the wrong cross and don't even know it. Tonight, how to know that I have the correct cross? Would you like to know that tonight? Yes, yes or no? Yes. How to know that I have the correct cross? Well, turn your Bibles to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. And we would read verse 18. John 19, verse 18. How to know that I have the correct cross? We read 17 and 18 just for it to flow nicely. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, on either side one and Jesus in the middle. God does nothing by chance, it's especially when it, 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 it came to his son, Jesus Christ. Everything happened by divine providence. Nothing regarding the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus on earth happened by chance. So I am convinced that the cross of Jesus was placed in the middle of two thieves for a particular purpose. I think it's important for us to know that. See, if these two thieves weren't there and, all the, and the only cross on Calvary was the cross of Jesus, it wouldn't make a difference for us. Because the truth is we very rarely refer to the other two crosses. Not true? We don't talk about the other two crosses. We only talk about the cross of Jesus. In fact, most times we forget that there were two other crosses. So if there were just that one cross, there were no thieves, just Jesus. Wouldn't make a difference for us. We'll preach the same sermons about the cross. We'll sing the same songs about the cross. We'll have the same drama presentations about the cross. So the question is this. If we could have the message of the cross without the two thieves, without the two other crosses, why did God orchestrate that there be two other crosses? I believe that these two other crosses, these two thieves, represent two things about each of us. 
See, you got to, every time you see something in the Bible, you got to see how it relates to you in regards to the mission of Christ. How does this relate to me? All this information here. How does this relate to me in my situation with regards to how Christ wants to save me? The salvation that he offers me. So this is what we're doing. Why these two other crosses? I believe these two crosses represent two things, two realities about each of us. One, we have a beginning. Two, we have an ending. Doesn't matter who you are. You have a beginning and you have an ending. Yeah? Amen? Good. I believe these two other crosses represent these two things about us. Our beginning and our ending. What is our beginning according to the Bible? The Bible says we were all born in sin and what? Shaped in iniquity. What is our ending? The wages of sin is? Death. That's it. That's the reality for every human being. We are born in sin. And the wages of sin is? Death. So that's it. Our beginning because of sin is sin. <laughs> And our ending because of sin is death. You can't run away from that. That's reality. And there are millions of people born in sin, lived in sin, died in sin. Can't run away from that. You can't change that. Nobody on earth could change that. That's what the Bible says. You cannot change what the wages of sin is. And you cannot change that your baby that's going to be born next month is going to be born in sin just like you did. You can't change any of this. You can go to church how much you want. That child is still going to be born in sin and shaped in iniquity. This is why by the time he's two years old, he refused to share the cookie with somebody else. You say, give him a little piece. You say, no. Why? He's born in sin. He's very cute, but he's born in sin. These are the two things. And I believe these two crosses represent these two things about us. So I want you to see these. These two crosses are up there on, the, on that hill. These two thieves, one on this side, one on the other side. Okay, listen very carefully. They know that they're going to die for what they've done. Right? They're going to die for what they've done. They deserve what they're getting. So they're on their crosses and they're prepared to die. But as they look down the hill, they see one more cross coming. In this cross, the man bearing this cross is different. First of all, he's not screaming, I'm innocent. <laughs> he's not screaming, I didn't do it. No, he's as silent as a lamb. Secondly, he's wearing a crown. They didn't get any crown. It's a crown of thorns, but it's a crown. And he's coming. Thirdly, there are a whole bunch of women following him. Whole lot of people. Nobody followed the thieves, but everybody's following this man. There's something special about him. And as they bring him, they threw his cross on the ground, nail his hand just as they did to these two thieves. And where does his cross go? Right in the middle of both of them. God orchestrated it that way to teach us a lesson. See, before the cross of Jesus came in the middle, you have a man here destined for death. And a man on that side destined for death. They represent your beginning and your ending. But then the cross of Jesus comes up in the middle and something happens. Something happens. There is a conversation, an exchange between Jesus and one of the men. And Jesus turned to him and Jesus says, Today I say to you, when I come in paradise, you will be with me what do what happened now now that the cross of jesus has come up in the middle something changed you have death on that side and death on the other side but now with the cross of jesus in the middle you still have death on one side but you got eternal life on the other side so how to know that you have the correct cross when your destiny is not hell but heaven you have the correct cross When you have accepted the promise of Jesus 
that when he comes in glory, you will be with him and you believe it with all your heart and you're not going to turn to the left or to the right. You're focusing right there. He promised me that he will save me when he comes in glory. I believe it. I will live it. You have the correct cross. Amen. Number two, you have the correct cross when Jesus is the center of your life. When you say Jesus is the center of your life, what you mean is this. He didn't change my beginning, but he has changed my ending. That's what it means to, when you say Jesus is the center of my life. When you wake up in the morning, what do you do? You go down on your knees and you spend time with Jesus. You have the correct cross. When there is a service at the church and there is a yearning in you to come to the house of God to worship Jesus, you have the correct cross. But when there is no desire for prayer, no desire for the Bible, no desire for transformation, you have a cross, but it's the wrong one. Everybody on this earth is holding on to a cross. In fact, you, <laughs> to get to heaven, you need a cross. And to get to hell, you need a cross as well. To get to heaven, you need the cross of Jesus. To get to hell, you need the cross of a thief. Are you understanding me, yes or no? And so when there is this desire in you for the things of God, you have the correct cross. Prayer. Reading your Bible. Spending time with God. Wanting righteousness. Desiring to glorify God. Putting God first. When you want to cuss, you change your mind. You don't cuss and then say it's your weakness. You change your mind. <laughs> and you decide I'm not going to cuss because I want to glorify God. He, you have the correct cross. Those who have the wrong cross just commit the sin and then say it's my weakness. Everybody is weak. You have your weakness, I have my weakness. No, no. You have the wrong cross, brother. If you have the correct cross, Christ is the center of your life. Amen? Amen. Number three. And this one is very important. How to know that I have the correct cross? And it's in verses 34 and 35. Same chapter, John chapter 19. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knows that he said the truth that we might believe, that you might believe. Isn't that interesting? Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that Jesus shed his blood for you on Calvary? Yes. Give me a Bible text that tells you that exactly. We have texts like, we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Yes. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. Yes. But give me a Bible text that says exactly that, or precisely that blood actually came out from his body. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, without the shedding of blood, yeah. But that doesn't tell you the blood came out from his body. This text here is the only one in the Bible. <laughs> Did you know that? It's the only text in the Bible that we have as Christians that says that blood actually came out from his body. And the person who saw it... <laughs> Listen to what the text says. The person who saw it testified about it so you can believe. Are you understanding? It's a very important passage of scripture. We just read it over like that. Because by faith we believe blood came out from the body of Jesus. But that doesn't mean that you have to ignore the only text that tells you so. Amen. It's a very important text. It tells us that a soldier pierced the side of Jesus and blood came out. When the Bible said they put a crown of thorns on his head, it didn't even say blood came out from his head. When the Bible said they beat him, he was beaten, it still didn't say blood came out from his back. When I was in Taiwan, 
Did, were you, did you? Yeah, you were in Taiwan before. I think you left before I arrived. I went to a museum in a city called uh, Kaohsiung. Yeah, they visited this museum, and there was this, uh, this, this whip with nine strands. And I'm standing there, and I'm watching it. And the curator came, and he said to me, well, he, it's very easy to notice a black man in Kaohsiung because that city don't see black people. So when he saw me, I, he was attracted. He, got a, he, he came, and he, he decided to talk. He saw me watching the belt, and he said, eh, do you recognize this? I said, uh, yeah, it's a, in Trinidad, we call it a cat nine. One belt with nine strands. And he began, he began to explain to me, uh, uh, tell me more about this belt. And he said, you see these hooks there? That's human bones. They took human bones, carved them out into hooks, sharpened the hooks. And then he said to me, the soldiers who used that had to be trained to whip the prisoner without getting the hooks hooked on themselves. And then he said to me, it was with one of these that they beat Jesus. The soldier had to pay very close attention. He had to be skilled to beat Jesus so that the hooks could get into his flesh and then pull it out. We know Jesus was beaten, yet the text doesn't say blood came out from his back. But here on Calvary, when the soldier pierced him, it's the only text that says blood came out. You understand that? Which means it's very important. It also means, listen to this, it also means that if this text, since this text is so important, it's the only text that tells us blood actually came out from his body, you cannot ignore that another fluid came out as well. Water. Which means, if you're going to preach about the blood of Jesus, you have to preach about the water of Jesus. Because the same text, the only text that tells us blood actually came out from his body, also tells us water came out from his body. Do not ignore the water. Because in fact, it is because of the water that came out from the body of Jesus, we are able to transition from here to there. So you've got to preach from your pulpit the importance of the blood of Jesus and equally the importance of the water of Jesus. When was the last time you heard a message about the water of Jesus? Everybody preaches about the blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus. You know, have you ever heard, you, you don't hear some of these churches when they get into their ha, ha, ha type of preaching? His blood, ha, ha. when he comes, ha, his blood ha, washes ha, your sins away. Ha. I hope you don't preach like that. Does he preach like that? In the ha, ha. Oh, Calvary, ha. The blood. Make a sentence. You can't make a sentence. Everybody preach about the blood. Everybody loves the blood. We sing about the blood. We even have a song. Oh, the blood that Jesus. Let's change it. The water. It will sound funny to people's ear. Oh, the water. That Jesus shed for me. Look at the look at the sister face. Huh? <laughs> and the water. But it is important. Do not ignore the water. And later on in this presentation tonight, it's a short presentation. We should end by about eleven. <laughs> let's let's talk about these two. Let's talk about the one that. The fluid that's easy for all of us. The blood. Why did the father allow blood to come out from the body of Jesus? Very simple. You know it already. Because since you became a Christian, you've been hearing about the blood of Jesus. So you could preach this part of the sermon for yourself. So I'm not going to waste, waste a whole lot of your time preaching about the blood of Jesus. Only to remind you of what you know. We are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Yeah. 
Amen. That's important. We are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Without the shedding of blood, there is what? No remission for sin. Amen. Yeah? Good. So when the blood came out from the, from the body of, of, of Jesus, what the Father was saying was this. This man in the middle, he is your Redeemer. Amen. He is your Redeemer. You are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The cross in the middle has the Redeemer hanging on it. And that's it. His blood redeems you. Amen. Wonderful. Great. You preach a good sermon. Everybody understands that. What does the water mean then? If the blood tells us he is the Redeemer, what does the water tell us about him? Well, let me ask you a question. <laughs> Whenever God in the Bible... Is telling his people or reminding them that he is the creator. He always says he made water. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was one, blah, 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 blah. And the last part says, and the spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the deep. Which means water was created before time came into existence. You got that? Water was there before there was a day. So water is the only thing on earth that was created in eternity. You, you understood that? Okay, some of you... you just <laughs> water was there before the Bible says, and the evening and the morning were there? First day. So if water was there over the earth, before the Bible says the evening and the morning were the first day, when did God make water? Before time came into existence. Therefore, we don't know when God made water, so we have to conclude that water was there before time came into existence. And before time came into existence, what was there? Eternity. When God was telling Israel, to worship him on the Sabbath day, he said, in addition to saying, I made the, he made the earth and everything, he said, he made water. In Revelation 14, he said the same thing. He made water. Therefore, if you want to be God, make water. If Allah for Islam wants to be God, let Allah make water. If Buddha wants to be God, let Buddha make water. If you could make water, you can be God. How much of this earth is water? More than 70%. How much of your body is water? 70%. How much of your brain is water? 80% of your brain is water. Which means the majority of God's creation is water. That's why God always boasts, He made water. <laughs> he made it. When? We don't know because time did not exist. He made water. So what God was saying is this. This man in the middle, watch this now. He is not only your redeemer. <laughs> he is also your creator. Amen. That means how to know I have the correct cross. When you receive Jesus, not only as your redeemer. But you are prepared to receive him as your creator. And that changes everything now. Y'all understood that? He is both redeemer and creator. Bible says everything was created by him, for him, and through him. Yeah? Say amen. amen. So in order for me to say I have the correct cross, I have to be one of those Christians on the earth who worship Jesus, not only as redeemer, but also as creator. Because water and blood came out from his side. Yeah? Wonderful. Now, we're moving on. Let me ask you. Well, not ask you. I'll just tell you. Did you know that the blood of Jesus is powerful because of the water? 
it is the water that qualifies the blood. In other words, Christ is our redeemer. He is qualified to be the redeemer because he is the creator. If he wasn't the creator, he's disqualified as a redeemer. Let me illustrate it for you. Mm -hmm. Let me use somebody here. Brother, you own a vehicle? How many? One. Okay, could you come please? You have a vehicle. I ain't going to use the pastor today. I'm going to use him sometime next week. I usually use the first person in the first bench, but I'll spare him today. Yes, brother, how are you doing? Come let the camera see you so you can be on TV. <laughs> Look, wave to the people there. Yeah, that Rowley cousin. <laughs> All right. So, Brother Rowley, <laughs> you own a car, right? Yes, sir. Oh, what, what, what make? What make? A Kia. A Kia. All right. <laughs> the cheap ones or the expensive ones? The more expensive the ones. More exp <laughs> I know that. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> the Kia. Yeah. So, yeah, you're a Kia man. Yes, sir. All right. So, Kia. All right. Great, great. It functions well. It, it, yes, it, everything is okay with the Kia? Had any trouble with it at all? Nothing. Not really. Good, 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 mileage. good mileage, everything, good on the gasoline and all of that. Don't make you cry, no headache. No. Okay, great. He owns a Kia, all right? I'm not advertising Kia here today. You got, you got a microphone so everybody can hear your great testimony about the Kia. Maybe the dealers can hear you and say, Let's and, give, give, and give me another one. Give you another one. All right. So you own a, a Kia, right? You own yeah. a Kia. All right. Um, let me ask you. You have any friends who are mechanics? Yes. Okay. If you have any problems with the, with the Kia, would you consider taking it to any of your mechanic friends? I do that. Oh, you do that already? Yeah. Oh, I thought you said nothing wrong with the car. <laughs> I need to service oh, it. Oh, right. Okay. Okay, so, so when you have to service the car, you go to your friends. My uh, mechanic. Your, your personal mechanic. Yes. Uh, you, you have a first name? Don't give us his whole name. What's Charles. his name? Charles. Brother Charles. Mr. Yeah. Charles. Mechanic Mr. Charles. Charles. Yes. Engineer Charles. Okay. So you take it to Charles. All right, so Charles, Charles uh, does a good job for you? Yes, he does. He does a good job for you, all right? And um, yeah, so Charles is good. Okay, bro, Charles, if you're watching, he's he, he bigging you up, all right? So next time he comes to you, <laughs> just uh, cut down the price a little bit. There you right? go. There you go. So let me ask you, um, why don't you take it to the, to the dealer? Too expensive. Too expensive. Too expensive. Okay. Next question. Between the dealer and Charles, Charles, who, who's better? The dealer. No, no, yeah, no, yeah, I know Charles watching. Don't, don't worry that much. <laughs> <laughs> Charles can handle it. <laughs> All right. Say it out loud. Don't, don't, don't. No dealer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He doesn't want Charles to know the truth. Because he, he don't want Charles to think that he brings the car and in his mind he's saying, God boy, I hope this man is uh, accurate. The dealer is better than you. No, no, it's okay. All right. So who's better, you say? The dealer. The dealer. Okay. When you go to Charles, does he give you original parts? We get original parts, yes. Yeah. So he has to go get it somewhere. He recommends that he, I use original oh, parts. Oh, so, all right. Okay. Because some of these mechanics, they're just up. Uh, Weld two pieces of iron together and then make a new That's wheel true. and all of that. Thing. Yeah. All right, so you do that. But if you take it to the dealer, everything is what? Supposed to be original. Original part. All Supposed right, all right. Don't try to bring them down now. <laughs> you know, let's, let's, let's stick with the reality. So, now you're trying to sugar up Charles. All right, so, so, so you, you, you have a Kia. Yes. And to get its service, you, you know in your heart of heart, you can take it to the dealership. Yes. Where they will deal with it better than Charles for because they if you manufacture take it, it, they, right, manufacture they manufacture it, it right. So they, they, they are the manufacturers so, so they know how to treat it. Yes. But you choose instead to take it to Brother Charles down by the corner. Right. Right? Because Brother Charles is, is cheaper. Yes. Right. But, he, but you know he's not going to give you a, a, a good job like the, like, the, like the manufacturers, yet you still do it, yeah? Okay, 
Right. So he may be the watching. manufacturers. Pastor, are, he may be watching. Right. He may be watching. Yeah, brother Charles, you ain't better than the manufacturers. <laughs> so I, I said what you you couldn't you didn't want to say. All right. <laughs> All right. He'll he'll deal with you with that afterwards. So I want you to notice something. It's very important. The best people to fix the Kia are the people who the made the Kia. Yeah. But you choose not to go to the manufacturer. You choose to go to some guy, Bakayad, who know a little some, some, who cannot even manufacture original parts. And you choose to go there because to go to the, the person who made the car is too much for you. So you go where it's cheap, only to find out a few months later, I'll go back to Charles again. Don't answer that, you can go and sit down now. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, what qualified Jesus to be our Redeemer? Because he made you. He knows your heart. He knows your mind. He knows your wicked. He knows how sin has destroyed you, which is why he came to be the Redeemer. Because he made you. This is why he said, I will give you a new heart. I am your creator. So when I come to redeem you, I'm giving you original parts. Original parts I will give to you. Because I made you. But here is the problem. This is why people prefer Jesus as the redeemer, not as the creator. Because if they go to him as creator, it costs them too much. They have to give up the reggae. They have to give up the soccer and the calypso. If they really go to him as creator, it's an original heart. So the heart that loves the things of this world, he takes it out. And gives you a new heart. Where you love not the world, neither the things of the world. But people don't want that. They prefer just the blood, not the water. Because to worship him as the creator, he's going to give you a new mind. Let this mind be in you. Which was also in Christ Jesus. How could Jesus go in carnival, wind up with a woman? Are you understanding the message? People want Jesus only as the Redeemer. They prefer only the blood. The problem is this. The blood gets its power from the water. Jesus is powerful as Redeemer because he is the Creator. Amen. Amen. So when we say in this campaign, receive Jesus as your Savior, we don't stop there. We say receive him as your Creator. Let him work in you, give you a new mind. Your walk is different. The way you talk is different. The way you dress is going to be different. What do we see in Christianity? Everybody wants Jesus' blood. They don't want his water. I call this the Justin Bieber type of Christianity or the Steve Harvey type of Christianity or the T.D. Jakes type of Christianity where you could dress how you want, eat what you want, drink what you want, have hip-hop in your church, have this in your church, have dance hall in your church, do this, just change the word, put Jesus in it. And it's accepted. No! Because when he created man, he created man in his own image. So when he comes to you, when the Bible says you are a new creature, it means he is going to recreate you back into his image. Are you understanding that? It's important to understand this text. And so how to know that I have the correct cross if I am being transformed by the renewing of my mind? If you are a Christian and you still with your hip hop, that's Kirk Franklin kind of thing. You still with your hip hop, still with your this, still with your bachata and your merengue, the Spanish folk, and your soca and your this. <laughs> you have a cross. But you have the wrong cross, which is why all you have is blood. You have no water. Even the blood is wrong. Because the blood on the other two crosses were not bloods of the blood of Redeemer. Are you understanding this message? I told you this message is transformative because from tomorrow night, 
we come in here. How the water is going to work. Are you understanding? So ladies and gentlemen, you must truly accept the cross of Jesus. Accept him as your redeemer. And let him work in you as your creator. That you will be transformed. So many members of the church are not being transformed. They've been members for years. And if you catch them one day in their car by themselves, you'll be surprised what they're listening to. You go home and you see the kind of movies they watch. You see the kind of video games they buy for their children and you wonder, isn't this an elder in the church? Am I too loud? Okay. Are you understanding, brother? And the reason we don't want the water, we don't want to turn to the Lord as creator, worshiping as creator, is too expensive. It will cost me my non-Christian boyfriend. It will cost me my non-Christian girlfriend. It will cost me my chains and my earrings and my jewelry and my this and my that. It will cost me too much. It's too expensive. But if I just take the blood, that's okay. I'd like to end with this. You might be in church, but you're not a member without the correct cross. Why? God created Eve from a rib in the side of Adam. The blood and the water came out from the side of Jesus. Which means those who are part of God's true church will accept both the blood and the water. Because the blood and the water coming out from the side of Jesus was God establishing now his church. Just as he took a rib from Adam and created a woman, blood and water created now a new woman. A new church. A church that acknowledges God as redeemer and creator. A whole bunch of Christians are in the building. They belong to a denomination. But they're not a part of that woman. The bride of Christ. Why? They reject the water. All Christians want the blood. Not everybody wants the water. Because it's too expensive. Brothers and sisters, those of you watching online, please, truly tonight, accept the Savior as your Redeemer and your Creator. Meaning, you are prepared for Him to transform your mind. Take, you, take your mind from this world put you on the things of the kingdom of God and you will worship him as your creator and your redeemer do you understand take him as your savior if you go on the church's website his website on the on the on Facebook you have this flyer here and you have the scan scan that with your phone fill the form say I accept Jesus because he wants to recreate you it's not enough to just say, Lord, forgive me. Wash me with your blood. Yes. He wants to recreate you. He wants to make you new. Not just forgive you and that's it. He wants to make you new. Scan the code. Scan it. And say that you have accepted Jesus. We will plan baptism in this church. We're planning that. Because we believe somebody... Or some people are going to accept Jesus. We believe that. Amen. Give your life to the Lord. Call the pastor. His name and number is on the flyer. Say, I have accepted Jesus as my Savior. And I want to be recreated. Tune in every night so you can learn. We transition into how God will put your life in order tomorrow night. You cannot miss it. And if there's anyone here, who must say, you know yourself, who must say, Lord, I've always been submitting to the blood, but I've been rejecting the water. 
because it was costing me too much, costing me my movies and the pleasures of this world. Now, tonight, I submit to you as my creator. And I'm willing to give up whatever it is I must give up so that you can recreate me with original parts. If you want that, stand to your feet. If you're watching a line and you want that right where you are, right where you are, if you are able, open your heart and say, Lord Jesus, I want you to recreate me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you our hearts. We choose you as our Redeemer and our Creator. That you will wash us clean and you begin that work of recreating us, making us again into the image and likeness of God. Please bless us. Bless those online. Bless those who must submit their all that they'll feel that conviction in their soul. Thank you for your power tonight and your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and see everybody tomorrow night.